Hello, members of the Highlands Ranch Historical Society. My name is Gordon, or Gordy Tucker, and I am here virtually, if you will, to tell you a little bit about Tel Shimron in Israel. And I've titled my presentation, Tel Shimron at the Crossroads of History. And this is just a view out, looking out over the Jezreel Valley from the site, Tel Shimron, looking southwest towards the Carmel Range in the distance there. So before we get into the topic of du jour, I'd like to tell you a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. I acquired my undergraduate degree at Western Washington State College in Bellingham, my master's degree at Idaho State University in Pocatello, and then finally my PhD at the University of Colorado in Boulder. As a result of coming to Colorado for my degree, I stayed and I've been here now since about uh, 20, uh, excuse me, 1970, no, excuse me, 1981, or 1977. I am a professional archeologist. I've been doing this for about 45 years and I'm presently the cultural resources team lead and the senior archeologist with AECOM Technical Services Inc. or AECOM in the Denver metro area. Uh, since 2012, I've been going to work at two major sites in Israel, Ashkelon from 2012 to 2016, and then Tel Shimron from 2017 to 2019. I was planning to go to Tel Shimron again this summer, 2020. However, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, the excavations this year have been canceled. While I've been in Israel, I've traveled to several major, several major archaeological sites in Israel, including Masada, Megiddo, Jerusalem, Caesarea Maritima, and Sufra. So I'll be showing some photos of several of these places a little bit later in this presentation. These are just a few photos of some of those locations. So at Tel Shimron, I have been privileged to study the chipstone artifacts and I have become a specialist, staff specialist on the project team. And I've been going to Israel now for nine years and people ask me, you know, why do I go there? Well, first of all, it's pretty darn inspiring. Here is a shot of uh, Jerusalem in the old city and sometimes we find some pretty cool things. But most importantly, for me anyway, as a professional archeologist, this is occupational therapy. This allows me to get out in the field and do the things I really love to do. So if we start at the beginning, uh, just a little bit of information about how we get there. So when I travel, I travel from Denver to Toronto in Canada and then from Toronto, we fly overnight into Tel Aviv. And the journey from Toronto, Denver to Toronto is about a little over 1300 miles, takes about three hours to get there. Toronto to Tel Aviv is almost 5,800 miles. It takes almost 12 hours to get there. The total, total trip is over 7,100 miles or close to 15 hours once I leave Denver and once I arrive in Tel Aviv. I've gotten used to the to the flight. I don't really sleep very well, um, but I read books and I see lots of movies. So as you come into the airport, the Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv, you walk down this rather um, awesome, uh, imposing ramp, and the first thing that you see are is evidence of the archaeological uh, treasures that Israel has, and then of course you go through the uh, the ubiquitous uh, passport control, and then eventually you come out into the Great Hall where uh, passengers meet their family or friends and uh, leave from there. So from Ben Gurion Airport down here outside Tel Aviv, we travel north to, and it's about 65 miles, to uh, where we usually stay is at Mitzra, which is a kibbutz, and then through most of the time we are in Israel, we, we, we work at the Mashab, we stay at the Mashab in the Halal. And the site is here, just, uh, just very close to Nahalal. 
And then the laboratory is a little about a mile to the east at Timrat. And speaking of uh, those places, so here is a view of Kibbutz, Kibbutz Mitzra and a very nice, looks like a mountain cabin kind of a place. Uh, very attractive, very pleasant place to stay. And uh, those are um, um, pomegranates. Um, you know, uh, living in Colorado, I, I go to different places. You know, they actually have oranges that grow on trees in places like California. Well, here you are in Israel with pomegranates growing on trees. And the laboratory is shown here, and people studying uh, the chipstone artifacts, which we'll come back to in a little bit. So mashav and a halal, a kibbutz and a, and a mashav are basically the same thing. A kibbutz is very uh, communal. Uh, everything is owned in community with everybody else. A mashav allows a little bit, little bit more uh, individuals to own the materials uh, and their means of or work, uh, uh, results of their uh, labor. So Nahalal is here, and you read in Hebrew, that's what that's Nahalal in Hebrew, and it was established and founded in 1921. It's the oldest Mashab in Israel. And they have a rather interesting geographic setup. The inner core, and you can see the, the circular arrangement of the town. You have the inner core is the public uh, buildings. Immediately surrounding that are residential buildings, and then on the outer ring are the agricultural, the fields, the agricultural fields. So very efficient and very uh, productive means of method of um, community organization. Down in the lower left there, you can see the um, dormitories where we stayed. There is a school there, like a high school, and uh, they're gone in the summer, and we stay there in the summertime. The middle photo is a view of the Mashav um, probably in the 1940s, and you'll notice the water tower tank there, and that's what it looks like today. And the other photo on the right is a shot looking up the street. And uh, you can see that uh, the symbol, the community symbol of that water tower is the uh, community symbol. So getting to the archaeology part, so here is a, an example of the what we call the tools of the trade. We have the patiche, which is a very small hand pick, very nice, very nice tool. We have what's called a turia, which is a hoe-like device. On the right there, we have gufas, and they're basically buckets, um, but they're made out of recycled tires, and my gosh, they're very, very efficient, much more efficient than this plastic bucket back here. And you see the trowel here, and the screen there, and then, of course, the big tools, the pickaxe. And then sometimes those screens can be used for many other types of activities. <clears throat> and here they are, the wheelbarrows, and all the tools, all packed up and ready to go. This is at the end of the day and ready to go home. So real quickly on how we tell time when we do archaeology. So if you look at a tell or a man made mound, human made mound, and if you cut it in half, you could see the various layers nicely colored here. They are fortunately, unfortunately, they're not colored in the field. But if we start at the bottom with the bedrock on which the site was founded for whatever reason, close to water, close to uh, crops, close to animals to hunt, and we find a pottery fragment at the very bottom, and it dates to, we dated it elsewhere to about 4,000 years before the Common Era, BCE. And we come up a little bit farther in the um, stratigraphy, and we have a pottery fragment dated to 2000 BCE towards the top of that uh, one sequence, the blue sequence. So we got a good idea that these layers in blue were deposited over about 2000 years. Then we move up into this next layer, which is a greenish olive colored, and we have a pottery fragment that dates to 1000 BCE. So another thousand years have passed in this settlement. And then we come over here and we actually have a, a, a radiocarbon date, which gives us a much more precise date to approximately 604 BCE. So the, um, between the green, there is a uh, windblown sand, so it suggests that the, the site was abandoned for a short period of time, and then a new settlement was built on top of the old, and that was about four, 400 years later. Then we find, find the coin in a pit, but that's dug from upper layers down into these earlier layers. So we know that, and it has a date, and date coins very precisely, a date of 100 BCE. So we know that that upper layer 
in the orangish um, zone is um, about 500 years later. And then we come up into this orangish zones that dates, to, and then we, we can see here another time when the site was abandoned and windblown sand came in and then settlement on top here. And that's dated to a thousand common era. So at least 1500 years have passed. And then finally up here on top of the mound, we find a coin dating to 1951, essentially modern. So that's how we tell time in a tell. And then we can put, when we get the dates, now we can talk about the people. So we have at the bottom the Canaanite, the Jewish settlements, there's a hiatus, then Persian, Hellenistic, Roman, another hiatus, finally Islamic, and then up here on top, of course, the modern. And we put that all together uh, in this part of the, what's known as the Southern Levant, which is the Eastern Mediterranean. We have a chronology, uh, uh, dates from the Neolithic through bronze, iron, and, and up into the more historic periods. Then those are broken down, those ages are broken down further into different periods and then different phases. And then finally, the dates of all of those phases. And these are all important for archeologists when you're digging in the area. Some of the important dates on here is in the late Bronze Age. These, this is when the Israelites arrived from Egypt uh, following Moses, if you recall, uh, from church school or your Bible. And then under David and Solomon, we have the United Monarchy during the Iron Age. We have the Assyrians who destroyed the Northern Kingdom in Israel in about in approximately 722 during the Iron Age II. And then finally the Babylonians came and destroyed the Southern Kingdom and took the Israelites to, uh, to exile in Babylon during the Iron Age II. And then finally moving forward many, uh, several decades, several centuries actually, uh, the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, was destroyed by the Romans in 70 Common Era. So a little bit now about Shimron. So here are some uh, some sites you might recognize. Jerusalem here. Here is Ashkelon, uh, where it's excavated. And then Shimron is up here in the northern part of the, the country. It's on, located on the northern edge of what's known as the Jezreel Valley here. Here is the Mediterranean. Nazareth is right here. So it's about four or five miles to the west of Nazareth. And this is just a view of the site in about the late 19th century. And this is the symbol for the excavations at Tel Shimon. So this is a view looking at the mound. The mound is on the left there. That's the Acropolis here, the highest point of the mound. And this area here is the compound. And this is a aerial view using LIDAR photography. And you can see some prominent areas. We have the Acropolis at the very top of the mound on the eastern side. Then you come downhill a little ways, you get the upper city, and there seems to be some sort of public building, perhaps a church, perhaps a synagogue. As we've learned, it is probably a synagogue. And then continuing downslope, we have uh, out here on the west, we have the modern road, but it, in ancient times, it was the Roman, what's known as the Legio Sepphoris Road. And then, of course, we have the uh, lower city. This is again the view of the, um, of the site with the Acropolis there. And as I said, the compound here. And this is the compound at the beginning of the summer. Not very many people around, still kind of getting organized. And then as we get into the season, that place fills up pretty fast with all of the workers there. Probably 40 or 50 people working on the site at, at different places on the site. So if you look at the uh, aerial overview of the, of the site, uh, we have several grid areas that we excavated. Uh, they're all numbered. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the site, which here's the Acropolis, the upper city, the lower city, uh, the road over here. So this is essentially the site here and it's all gridded off into um, a thousand square meters here and then further uh, divided into smaller units. This is grid 92 here Grid 94, we're working our way up from the lower part of the city to the upper part. Grids 23, 24, and then finally grid 33 at the upper part of the, of the town. So back to the compound, dining house is where we eat as well as do our analyses. And we ate, we eat very well, as you can see, and abundantly. So looking at grid 92, again, this is a view out over the Jezreel Valley, looking towards the 
Carmel Range here in the distance, and the Mediterranean is just out of sight over here by Haifa. Here is grid 92 in these clump of trees. Just another view of that. And here is a view of the excavations. Uh, they're just beginning. Some of the areas have been taken down quite a ways. Others, not so much. And then eventually these areas get taken down and you can see walls, stone walls begin to appear. And all kinds of manner of artifacts are found. And this was actually a modern cistern that was uh, unfortunately a big hole in the middle of our ancient deposits, but also was beneficial in that we could see, we could actually get a, a good view of these deposits when we looked at the edge of the, um, of the cistern. So to date, here is what we see, and if you remember that one uh, chronology that I provided, we have evidence of the Middle Bronze II uh, down here at the, at the bottom, but most of the, most of the found quite a bit of evidence of the Hellenistic or Greek and Roman, and then there seems to be a gap with that gap. I'm guessing that gap will probably be filled. Then we move over to 94, grid 94, located here, a little bit to the north of 92. And just another view of that. So when we come in the beginning of the summer, of course, over the winter, vegetation grows, blows in, lots of dirt and dust. And this is before the cleaning. And then after the cleaning, much nicer. We archaeologists are very neat and uh, um, efficient. And as you can see, we're beginning to uh, expose some walls that are buried very close to the surface. So these are, of course, more, more recent, maybe Roman era. And uh, as I said, you know, sometimes, you know, tools can be used for multiple purposes. And in this case, during our rest break, it's a good place to sit and relax. And in order to go deeper, usually, or not all, not usually always, in order to go deeper, we have to remove what's above. So once we know exactly what we have up here, then we remove and tear down this wall. And this is an example of one of the stones. You can see the batiche here. So it's a pretty good sized rock that was used to build this wall here. There it is with the wall removed, the stones removed. Sometimes we find some interesting things in situ in place. Here was a pot that was in place um, and then eventually it was removed. You can see the soil around it there and then that was removed. So the top was broken off, the bottom was broken off intentionally we're not really sure what it may have been used for. Someone suggested it might have been used as a bathroom. And then here we find a leg of a donkey. So, okay, so that was grid 90, 94. We move uphill to grid 2324. And lots of walls here outlining what we think might have been a synagogue and or and it had a ritual bath, a mitzvah, uh, um, not mitzvah, um, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank now, and no, it'll come back to me. Anyway, lots of um, monumental architecture in here. And one thing I want to point out is the shade cloths. You've seen in all of the grid units we're working, we have these shade cloths, which are very nice to protect us from the heat of the sun. Or you notice in this photo, where is the um, shade cloth? You can see the poles that held it up. Isn't that rather puzzling? Well, interestingly, one day we had a little microburst and that shade cloth and, and some of the poles got blown uphill into a tree and we had to go rescue it from a tree. So sometimes Mother Nature wreaks a little havoc with our what we humans like to do. And again, here we have the settlement. So mostly in the more recent uh, time periods at 23, 24. And then finally, we move up to the very top of the mound in the Acropolis, grid 33. And as you can see, lots of monumental architecture up here, a large public building, perhaps even a temple up there. We're just, we're just beginning to expose it. <coughs> and as time, go on, time goes on, we'll begin, hopefully we'll begin to fill in the gaps or at least explain why there may be gaps there. So again, just another view of the mound, of the temple, uh, excuse me, the, the tell. And one of the things that I'm interested in, of course, is the rocks from which the chipstone tools were made. So underneath, so we know that the 
uh, man-made portion of Tel Shimron um, was built on what was a natural mound that was next to the creek that runs through the Jezreel Valley. And we can see that in, in profile. And the underlying rocks, and I wanted to point out in particular, this Eocene formation, which is a limestone. And in that formation, here, here is some basalt from which ground stone tools are made. And then you can see in this limestone, this Eocene chalk, you can see these uh, flint nodules. And then a little closer view of the flint nodules. And they're very similar to some of the rocks that we see when we analyze the chip stone. So we are pretty certain that many, if not all, of the raw materials for the chipstone artifacts come from very close to the tell. And the types of chipstone artifacts we see are arrowheads. We see a sickle blade, which is indicative, obviously, of, of agricultural pursuits, so the harvesting of grains of some sort. This is the byproducts of making some of these stone tools, and this is the original rock from which flakes were taken off. Again, another arrowhead over here. And all these, uh, these uh, um, uh, sickle artifacts, sickle blades, are equivalent, as I just showed, with they're placed into this curved, in this case, um, bone or sometimes antler, and individual pieces placed there and function as a mod, like a modern sickle would. So now I'm going to leave uh, Tel Shimran and move to some nearby sites. As I mentioned earlier, we, we get an opportunity to travel to different sites while we're in Israel. Opening the door. So here's Shimran again. And we're going to go to Nazareth, Sepphoris, uh, Megiddo, up here to Haifa, and then over here to Caesarea Maritima. So Nazareth, I think everyone is probably pretty familiar with Nazareth. Um, um, and it has a rather nice basilica here. Uh, one of the places is known as Mount Precipice and have two different views. The one on the top there is looking out to the east towards Mount Tabor right here. And then this is a view from below. This is actually from the Mitzra uh, kibbutz looking towards Mount Precipice. And this is, if you recall from your Bible, they got up, drove him, that would be Jesus, out of the town, led him to the brow of the hill in which their own town was built, that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. And I can assure you, if anybody was, anybody was hurled off this cliff, they would uh, either not survive or they'd be pretty banged up. And interestingly, on the ridge that's just to the west of Nazareth are some a lot of chipstone art. Um, in situ, the, in the rock itself, so the you have seen the flint nodules that are similar to the ones that we find at the site. So now we're moving up to Sepphoris, and Sepphoris is about four uh, miles, four or five miles north of Nazareth. It was the big city in the area, and it was a Roman city at one point. And you can see the stone road here, pavement. You can see up close, you can actually still see the marks of the wagons or the, perhaps even the chariots that have been scored into the rocks. This is a limestone, so it's relatively soft. Here is Nazareth on the horizon looking from Sepphoris towards south towards Nazareth. And this was a scratched into the stone is some sort of board game from Roman times. And we have many influences all the way from earliest times to modern Greek or not modern, but Hellenistic Greek. Here's a view of the Roman temple. Um, it's been repurposed today uh, to have modern stage shows, but you can see remnants of the original ancient synagogue here, and it's been reconstructed so people can sit and watch stage shows or concerts. This is what it might have looked like in ancient times. Then later in period and time, and well, quite a bit later, the 1800s, it was, uh, well, this is what it looked like in 1875, but it was a crusader, so probably 11, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, 80, 1,100. It was a crusader and then an Ottoman fortress. And this is how it looks today. And you will notice that on the corners of the building, they repurposed. These were Roman uh, sarcophagi or burial, uh, burial chambers. 
and they've repurposed them that fits very nice, neatly into this um, edifice here. Just another view of those Roman, very distinctive Roman sarcophagi. sarcophagi. Just another view from the other side. One of the things that Sepphoris is known for is, are its mosaics, which are absolutely incredible. And this is just a view of how those mosaics are created. And when you actually see them, you can see the intricate work that has been done. In particular, this one is known as the Mona Lisa of the Galilee. And I, I just look at that, the, the detail, the tiny stones that were used to create this, um, this image is, is rather amazing. So then moving, <clears throat> sorry, to the other side of the Jezreel Valley, to Megiddo, about eight miles to the south of Shimron. And Megiddo, uh, this was the reported place where the end times would come and is known as Armageddon. That's Har Megiddo is where we get the word Armageddon. And this is where the, the forces of light and good and evil would battle and uh, and, um, and, it, and it was founded upon battles that probably occurred here because Megiddo is located around what's known as the Via Maris, an ancient road that came up from the south to Caesarea Maritima, across the, the hills, the Carmel Range, into Megiddo. Megiddo was strategically located to force um, invaders or others to either not come that way or pay the price. And then as it comes up, uh, <clears throat> to the north, it continues through Nazareth up here to the northern part of Israel, now Israel, and then it continues on to Damascus and further, farther to the east. And here we have uh, Tel Shimron. And this is what Megiddo looks like. It's an aerial view of Megiddo, a large mound. It's been excavated since, uh, well, certainly from the 1930s to today, and just the various uh, areas on the, on the site. And this is a, a, a model of the, it's in the uh, visitor center. And uh, in the 1920s, the uh, archeologists cut this deep trench in the different areas of Tel Megiddo, and they could see 20, 26 distinct layers of the city, i.e. different occupations, starting from the Neolithic period about 8,300 years ago, all the way up to the Persian period in about up to 300 BC. And each time the occupations, each level then raised the height of the mound to the point that now it's very several tens of feet above uh, the, the valley, uh, the, the uh, area around it. And this is just a view of those, those many, many layers in the mound. This is, an, this is a technique, archeological technique. It isn't really used too much anymore. Generally now we come down slowly layer by layer by layer and expound out, expand outward from that to understand how people were actually living at a certain point in time. This is the back dirt pile. This is where all the dirt that came out of this the cut as well as other places on the site. This is where it was all piled. It's a rather impressive mound on the uh, northern, northeastern side of the mound of Megiddo. This is just showing you some of the details. So this is a Canaanite gate, about 1500 BCE. And then there's an earlier Canaanite um, palace here. And then up here we have the, the gate, Israel, Israelite gate, a little different from a little different time period, about 500 years later. And this is what the Canaanite gate looks like. It's a uh, two-chambered gate, or excuse me, four-chambered gate, and this is looking up through that gate. And then the Israelite gate is a six-chambered gate, and you can see three, three chambers on this side, and the other side has actually been removed during excavation, but there would have been three similar um, um, uh, rooms over here. And that's a very distinctive uh, style, architectural style, that's a generally attributed to King Solomon. So here we have Megiddo, which we were just talking about. We have uh, Hatzor here, and we have Gezer. And they all have this very distinctive six-chambered gate. This is a view out over Megiddo, and then uh, it has an interior uh, source of water that uh, allowed them to survive. If they were attacked, they could survive for quite a long time with water available inside the walls and go down into that today. 
uh, visit the, the water source. And then up on top, there was a sacred area where there was an early Bronze Age mound, and this whole area was used for ceremonial purposes down through the ages. They also had a way of storing grain, again, for protection and defense. Um, and this is 23 feet deep. It could hold over 12,000 bushels of grain. It was dating to about the seven, mid 700s BCE. And you can notice this uh, walkway, stairway, uh, stair path walkway coming down. And then you climb back out up this. So people could come up and go back out this way so they weren't having to cross um, on this very narrow step stepway stairs. So let's go out to the coast to Haifa. Haifa here on the uh, Mediterranean coast. This was just a, a fun day. We didn't do any archaeology but it's a gorgeous place on the coast as you can see. One of its uh, highlights is what's known as the Baha'i Gardens which is a um, an offshoot of uh, Islam, the Baha'i faith, and they have a gardens and temple here up on the side of the hill. This is the Carmel Range behind Haifa. It's the uh, shrine of the Bab, who was the founder of Babism, which is the forerunner of the Baha'i faith. And then looking from the top down, just a magnificent place. I, I looked at this when I visited and I said, I'd love to, I'd love to cut their grass. It looks just marvelous. Gorgeous view, kind of reminds me of California. And we go to Caesarea Maritima on the coast, a little farther to the south on the Mediterranean coast, over here. And it was built by Herod the Great um, in about 22 to 10 BCE. And it used to be a Phoenician naval station known as Stratos Tower. And he, Herod renamed it in honor of the Roman Emperor, Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And he constructed a deep sea harbor here using underwater concrete or concrete that that set underwater using some volcanic ash he got from Italy. Uh, it was one of the largest artificial harbors built in the open sea and closed a large area. Eventually, however, it didn't survive and uh, you don't see that. And I'll show you a picture of the area today. So here it is, and this would have been here. This would be the, uh, the former uh, harbor here and most of the walls are now below the level of the sea uh, surface. And you can see the outline of Caesarea Maritima. This is a racetrack. You have the, uh, uh, the stadium here, and the city continues, the ancient city continues out over here, and you can see the modern. And up here, you can see the aqueduct that carried water down to the, to the uh, city. And this is a view into that, looking from here. And this is the, uh, the theater, and it's been partially reconstructed. And again, like we saw at Sepphoris, that's used for modern concerts and performances. One of the things they found at Caesarea Maritima, and this is a replica, but it's a what's called the Pilot Stone, as in Pilot, Pontius Pilate. And on it, it was inscribed to the divine Auguste, Caesar Augustus, Tiberium, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea, has dedicated this. So um, extra biblical or archaeological archeo evidence that I'm someone named Pontius Pilate actually lived at one point in time. Just some views out over the, uh, the, the Caesarea Maritima. It's a very nice place. The uh, water is crystal clear. It's really beautiful. You have power plant here in the distance. And you have what's known as the Cardo Maximus, which is essentially Main Street. And you can see this is Roman era. You can see the stones, some of them still remaining in the, uh, in the street. One of the places that was rather interesting, I thought it was interesting, is known as the Mithraeum. It's located here. And what it is, is a shrine to the Persian god, Mithras. So these three areas here are shrines. But if you go into the center one here, you can see that this, this is intentional. This wasn't um, um, an accident or, or a stone dropped out. This this was intentional to have an opening where the light could shine straight down on what was the what they would call the altar. And the altar once sat right here and you can see the light shines right on top of the altar. It would have shone, shone right on top of the altar. So that's it for my presentation. I want to say goodbye from Israel. I want to say shalom you all.
and thank you.